respected ulama, my respected elders, my brothers, my sisters, and my little ones, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After praising the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations on our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I begin as always by first thanking you, my host, for giving me this opportunity to convey the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of yours in listening to this message as I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of mine in trying to deliver the message of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it was revealed on our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over 1400 years ago in its true and pure form. My young friends, our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's maqam our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's status is so great that the human mind cannot comprehend the greatness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In a nutshell, our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so great that he comes second to the Almighty Allah. This is why when you declare the kalima la ilaha illallah, I testify there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. Whether you declare Muhammad Rasulullah, I testify and bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly is the messenger of Allah. If you acknowledge the greatness of Allah, if you acknowledge the oneness of Allah and you do not acknowledge the greatness of Rasulullah and the Prophet of Rasulullah or Insan, you cannot be a believer, you cannot be a mu'min, you cannot be a Muslim, you cannot enter the fold of Islam, my young friend, you cannot attain salvation, you cannot acquire the pleasure of Allah. You cannot save yourself from the fire of hell and acquire the elevated ranks of paradise if you declare the oneness of Allah, the greatness of Allah, and with it you do not declare the greatness of Rasulullah and the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is why when a proclaimer proclaims the adhan, he declares, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. And with it, he declares, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness there is no God worthy of worship of Allah. And I bear witness Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. This is why in salah, you praise Allah. And with it, you praise Rasulullah. You say, At-tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibatu. And with it, you say, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes second to the Almighty Allah. No being greater than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has ever set foot on this world. And no being greater than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will set foot on this world right till the day of judgment. Our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so great. That not only the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah acknowledge the greatness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when they would see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would cry out, Hada Muhammad, Hada Sadiq, Hada al Amin. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the truthful one. This is the trustworthy one. Not only did the Arabs of Jahiliyyah acknowledge the greatness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My young friends, at this moment in time, 1400 years on from the, the, the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa even to this day, you have people from amongst the kuffar, the just from amongst the kuffar, that don't believe in Allah and his Rasul. To this day, they acknowledge the greatness of Rasulullah and they praise Rasulullah and will continue to do so right till the day of judgment. 
To this day you have people that did not declare the kalima, but in spite of not believing in Allah and His Rasul, they acknowledge the greatness of Rasulullah and they praise Rasulullah and they will continue to do so right till the day of judgment. Lama time. He wasn't a believer. He didn't believe in Allah and His Rasul. He didn't declare the kalima La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But in spite of the fact that he was not a believer, this is what he had to say with regards to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are his words. Who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Major Arthur, another kafir. Person that didn't believe in Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what he had to say with regards to our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He writes, A man not only great, but one of the greatest that humanity has ever produced. Bernard Shaw, again, not a believer, did not declare, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. This is what he had to say with regards to our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, he, referring to our beloved Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, must be called the savior of humanity. I believe that if a man like him were to assume the dictatorship of the modern world, he would succeed in solving the problems in a way that would bring it the much needed peace and happiness. I ask you, my young friends, what made our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so great? That not only the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah acknowledged his greatness and would praise him and would cry out, Hadha Sadiq, Hadha Al-Ameen, Hadha Muhammad. This is Muhammad, this is the truthful one. This is the trustworthy one. Not only did the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah acknowledge the greatness of Rasulullah, to this day, they're just from the Kuffar, Praise Rasulullah and will continue to do so right till the day of judgment. What made our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so great? That the Kuffar acknowledged the greatness of Rasulullah. What made our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so great, my young friends, was his personality. His conduct, his character, the way he spoke, the way he dealt with people, the way he received people, the warmth that he gave them. The way he interacted with the masses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your character is sublime. Your akhlaq are azim. Your akhlaq are great. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are far and beyond. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, indeed, you are something different. You are something special. The poet puts it so beautifully. He writes, بَلَغَ الْأُولَى بِكَمَالِهِ كَشِفَتْ دُجَا بِجَمَالِهِ حَسُنَتْ جَمِيعُ خِسَالِهِ سَلُّ عَلَيْهِ وَعَالِهِ That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached the highest maqam. The highest maqam that can be attained and reached by a human being. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached the highest point بِكَمَالِهِ because of his perfection. His outer perfection, his inner perfection. Allah had assembled all the excellencies and virtues of character in the person of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every seven, every attribute of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had reached the peak of excellence. It couldn't get any better. It was perfect. Every attribute, every seven had reached the peak of excellence. It could not get any better. His beauty had reached the peak of excellence. Look at the beauty of our beloved Nabi. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whenever a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would describe Rasulullah after his description of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the companion of Rasulullah would confess would confess lam ara qablahu wa la ba'dahu mislahu I swear by Allah I have never seen a man before Rasulullah like Rasulullah and I've never seen a man after Rasulullah like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever a companion of Rasulullah 
describe Rasulullah, he would end with these words. I have never seen a man like Rasulullah before Rasulullah and I have never seen a man like Rasulullah after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Every companion, open the books of a hadith where they describe Rasulullah, this is what you will find at the end of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She would say, Lawami Zulaykha law ra'ina jabeenahu. Our mother said, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala would say, okay, the women that were mesmerized by the beauty of Yusuf and because they were mesmerized by the beauty of Yusuf rather than putting the fruit in front of them, they cut off their hands, then women cut off their fingers. She says with regards to those very same women, if those women that were mesmerized by the beauty of Yusuf and they cut off their fingers, if those very same women saw not the entire body of my Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa not even the entire face of Rasulullah, if those very same women just saw the beauty of the forehead of my Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa never mind their hands, then very same women would be so mesmerized that they would take out their hearts and they would cook them just by looking at the beauty of Muhammad. This was as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The hadith of Sayyidina Jabir comes to mind, the hadith in Tirmidhi. And Sayyidina Jabir narrates a beautiful hadith that on one occasion, our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seated in the masjid, in the house of Allah, in the masjid of Rasulullah. And there was the moon of the 14th night so beautiful, so complete, and so bright. And Rasulullah was seated inside the masjid. He says, I wanted to gauge. I wanted to see which is more beautiful. Is the face of my Habib more beautiful? Or is the moon of the 14th night more beautiful? He says, one look at the moon and one look at the face of Rasulullah. Again, one look at the moon and one look at the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I had no choice but to come to this decision that the face of my beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more beautiful than the moon of the 14th night. He says, as much as I wanted to look at the moon, my eyes were transfixed on the beautiful face of Rasulullah and my eyes would not leave the face of Rasulullah to look at the moon and he come to this decision that the face of Rasulullah was more beautiful than the moon of the 14th night. Every attribute of Rasulullah sallallahu had reached the peak of excellence. It couldn't get any better. His beauty had reached the peak of excellence. His piety had reached the peak of excellence. His purity had reached the peak of excellence. His love had reached the peak of excellence. His compassion had reached the peak of excellence. His mercy had reached the peak of excellence. His kindness had reached the peak of excellence. His sympathy had reached the peak of excellence. His self-denial had reached the peak of excellence. His perseverance had reached the peak of excellence. His ibadat and worship had reached the peak of excellence. His Kindness had reached the peak of excellence. His forgiveness had reached the peak of excellence. His humility had reached the peak of excellence. His humbleness had reached the peak of excellence. Every sifat had reached the peak of excellence. It couldn't get any better. And in spite of the fact that every sifat was kamil, it was complete, it was perfect, it couldn't get any better. The attributes of love, compassion, and mercy of Rasulullah in comparison to the other attributes, even though the other attributes were kamil, mukammal, they were perfect, it couldn't get any better. The attribute of mercy, love and compassion in comparison to the other attributes of Rasulullah was like the moon amongst the stars. Every star is beautiful, but what is it in comparison to the moon? Every sifat and attribute of Rasulullah was kamil, was perfect, was beautiful. But what to say of the mercy of Rasulullah? That Allah Himself says in the Quran, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you were sent as a mercy for mankind. You were sent as a mercy for the humankind. You were sent as a mercy for the jinn kind. 
you were sent as a mercy for the animal kind. You were sent as a mercy for the plant and tree kind. You were sent as a mercy for the stone kind. You were sent as a mercy for the believing kind. You were sent as a mercy for the non-believing kind. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad, whatever is out there, whatever it may be, you were sent as a mercy for all. Let me give you just one example of the mercy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in today's session. Just one example of the mercy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in today's session. I ask you my young friends, <coughs> how did our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receive the people of Makkah? When Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Makkah as a Fatih, as a conqueror in the eighth year of Hijrah, how did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receive the people of Makkah? The very people that persecuted him, not for a day or two, not for a week or two, not for a month or two, not for a year or two, from the moment our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared, La ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and I Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly is the messenger of Allah from the moment he declared La ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah right till Makkah was conquered 21 years of his life they persecuted him they belittled him they insulted him they would rebuke him they would swear at him. They insulted his followers, his family members. They would persecute them. They would torment them. They would torture anyone that declared the kalima La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. From the dawn of Islam, right till the eighth year after Hijrah, when Makkah was conquered, over 21 years of his life, how did that very same Prophet of Mercy receive? The very same people of Makkah when he entered as a Fatih and a conqueror with 10,000 men, an army so big that the Muslims in their own history had never seen an army so big. How did our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receive the people of Makkah? Let me take you back 1400 years, my young friends. <clears throat> Let me take you back 1400 years and ask you, when our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared the kalima la ilaha illallah, how do you think the people of Makkah receive our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Bearing in mind that the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah before Islam came were no ordinary people. These people were the lowest of the low. At that time, there were no people on the face of the earth more lower than the Arabs of Jahiliyyah. They were so low and in the depths of ignorance and darkness that the two superpowers of the time, the Romans and the Persians, that ruled the entire world from the east to the west, the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah did not interest the Romans as well as the Persians. These people, every sin that you can imagine was rife within their community. From adultery to fornication, to polytheism, to gambling, to burying their daughters alive. Every sin that you can imagine, the Arabs of Jahiliyyah were committing. These people did not know what morality was, akhlaqiyat. These people did not know what insaniyat was. They did not know what humanity was. They were the lowest of the law. There was not even an iota of mercy inside their own hearts. Akra ibn Habis has declared the kalima la ilaha illallah. And he's sitting in the majlis of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam happens to kiss one of his grandson Hassan or Hussein. And Akra bin Habib says to our beloved Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I have 10 children 
And to this day, I have never ever kissed any one of them. I have never ever embraced any one of them. These were the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah before they declared the kalima La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Not even an iota of mercy inside their hearts. They wouldn't embrace their children. They wouldn't kiss their children. Never mind embracing their children. Never mind kissing their children. My young friends, their own daughters, they would not hesitate to take their daughters, their own flesh and blood and bury them alive. Their eyes wouldn't flinch. Their hearts wouldn't soften. Their hearts wouldn't melt. They would take their daughters, two-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, one-year-old. They would adorn her. They would beautify her. They would comb her hair. They would make her wear new clothes. And they would tell her that today we're going to take you on a trip. We're going to take you to visit a distant relative. And this girl would be so happy and so overjoyed that today I'm going somewhere with my father. And this father would take this very own child of his to some jungle and some desert. And then he would begin to dig a pit inside the earth. He would begin to dig a hole inside the earth. And after digging this hole, he would take this child, he would carry her with his own hands and he would lower her inside this pit, inside this hole. And then he would begin to overturn the earth. And as he's overturning the earth on his own flesh and blood, his daughter, the child would begin to scream. She would begin to uh, cry. She would begin to shout. Tears would begin to flow from her eyes. And she would turn to that very Abba, the very father, and beg for mercy. And say, oh Abba, I beg you, take me out of this hole. Oh Abba, you're hurting me. You're harming me. You're overturning the earth on me. Oh Abba, I beg you, don't do this. Oh Abba, I beg you, take me out. Embrace me, kiss me, and love me. My young friends, the Arab of the Jahiliyyah, his heart wouldn't melt when his own daughter would beg him for mercy. He would keep on overturning the earth. He would keep on overturning this earth. And the girl would cry and yell and scream and beg. His heart wouldn't melt, my young friends. He would become deaf and blind to the cries of his own flesh and blood till silence would prevail. And with his own hands, he would have killed his own flesh and blood. These were the Arabs of Jahiliyyah. There was not an iota of mercy inside their own hearts for their own flesh and blood. Every day of the week, they had a different God. Some of them would worship the sun. Some of them would worship the moon. Some of them would worship the stars. Some of them would worship the seas. They would fight with one another for, on petty little things. And then these fights would break out into wars. And these wars would continue for years on end. Look at our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he migrated to Medina al Manawwara and he met with the tribes of Aus and Khazraj that resided in Medina. How long did the tribes of Aus and Khazraj fight with one another before the dawn of Islam? 120 years these two tribes fought with one another. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لو أنفقت ما في الأرض جميعا ما ألفت بين قلوبهم ولكن الله ألف بينهم O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you spend everything within this dunya to join the hearts of the Aus and Khazraj and place, place the love of one in the heart of the other, place the love of the Aus in the heart of the Khazraj and place the love of the Khazraj in the heart of the Aus. O oh Muhammad, how do you spend everything within this dunya? You would not have been able to unite them. You couldn't unite them. It was Allah and the mercy of Allah alone that he united the hearts of the Aus and Khazraj and placed the love of one another in the heart of the other. These were the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah. Bearing this in mind, a people that did not possess an iota of mercy for their own flesh and blood and would not hesitate to bury their own children alive. Now I ask you, my young friends, the million dollar question. How do you think these very same people receive Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? 
when Allah chose Muhammad as the last and final Nabi, and Muhammad وسلم, declared, Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wa ashadu anni rasul Allah, that I testify there is no God worthy you worship but Allah, and I testify that I, Muhammad, is the messenger of Allah. How do you think the Arabs of Jahiliyyah receive Muhammad وسلم, when they believe that this man is insulting their intellect, this man is insulting their gods, this man is insulting their idols, this man is insulting the religion of their forefathers and is insulting their forefathers. This man is causing division within the Meccan society. This man is causing fitna and strife within the people of Mecca and separating them. How do you think they received Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when this is what they believed? Let me take you back 1400 years, my young friends. And our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has received prophethood. It's the dawn of Islam. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been chosen by Allah as the last and final messenger. Allah has honored Rasulullah with prophethood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders our beloved Nabi. Fasta bima tu'mar waridan al mushaykeen O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam openly declare la ilaha illa Allah Muhammad the Rasulullah and invite the masses in every corner of the globe to the kalima la ilaha illa Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is burdened with such a great responsibility that even if the mountains were burdened with such a responsibility the, bird, the mountains would have turned to dust Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa is so desperate to invite the people of Makkah to the kalima la ilaha illa Allah he's so desperate to give them the keys to paradise He's so desperate to save them from the fire of hell. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveys the message. Ya iwan nas, O people, Kulu la ilaha illa Allah. Say la ilaha illa Allah. Tufli'u. O people, you will attain salvation. O people, you will save yourself from the fire of hell. O people, you will save yourself from the fire of Jahannam. Say la ilaha illa Allah. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so desperate to take them with him to paradise and save them from the fire of hell. As Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa would invite them to the kalima la ilaha illa Allah. Somebody would insult him and say, Kinaim bai, majnoon, don't listen to this man. This man is a madman. This man is insane. This man, his mind doesn't work. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa again invites them to the kalima la ilaha illa Allah. Or people say la ilaha illa Allah. Tuflihu, Allah will be pleased with you. Your creator, your fashioner, your Lord will embrace you. Again, somebody insults. Your people do not listen to him. Kahin, this man is a magician. This man is a soothsayer. This man is a foreteller. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would ignore them. And again, Rasulullah would invite them to the kalima la ilaha illa Allah. This time somebody would insult him. Sha'ir, or people do not listen to him. He's a poet. Again, Rasulullah would invite them to the kalima la ilaha illa Allah. This time somebody would insult him. Innama yu'allim mubashal. He's been taught by a Christian slave. This is what's recited upon him every morning and every evening. Whenever the Nabi of Allah would invite them to the Kalima, my young friends, this is the warmth that they would receive Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with. Somebody would say he's Majnoon. Somebody would say he's Sahir. Somebody would say he's Shair. Somebody would say, Asatir al Awaleen. These are Jack and Norris. These are just stories. He makes them up as he goes along. I ask you, my young friends, how do you think our beloved Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam must have felt when they insulted him like this? How do you think he must have felt? And this wasn't one day. This wasn't one week. This wasn't one month. From the moment he declared the kalima la ilaha illa Allah till Makkah was conquered. 21 years of his life. This is what would ring an echo inside his ears. Majnoon, Kahin, Sahir, Shahir, Asatir al awwaleen Innama yu'allamu bashar. My young friends, if here and now, if I were to say with regards to this individual that he's pagal, he's insane, and then he were to leave these doors, and then somebody, he met somebody outside, and he also said to him, Kebai, Majnoon, you're pagal, you're insane, your mind doesn't work. And then he were to go to his house, and there he meets his wife, and his wife and family members also say to him, you're pagal, you're insane. I swear by Allah, even a sane man, if this is the ordeal, and if this is what he receives from those around him, even a sane man after three, four days will begin to believe that he's insane if this is how people receive him.
A sane man would begin to believe that he's insane. If wherever you go, people are saying you're pagal, you know, at the beginning you'll say, you know, this, there's something wrong with this guy. But if this is what, what you keep on hearing with regards to yourself, after three and four days, you'll begin to think, you know what? All these people can't be wrong. It must be me. There must be something wrong with me. And you'll begin to believe that you're insane, even if you're not insane. So how do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt? It wasn't about three, four days. It wasn't just one or two individuals. More or less, it was the entire community of Makkah. And it was day in, day out, night in, night out for over 21 years of his life. 21 years of his life. Nabi Kareem وسلم, makes his way to the market of Dil Majaz. This is where the kuffar would gather before Hajj for business, for trade. And thereon, they would proceed to Makkah al-Makarramah and perform the rituals of Hajj. Nabi Kareem وسلم, is in the market of Dil Majaz. The people are gathered around him. And Rasulullah وسلم, is inviting them. Ya nas, kulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Or people say la ilaha illallah. Say there is only one God worthy of worship and that God is Allah. You will attain salvation. And the people are becoming inclined towards Rasulullah. Their hearts of stone are beginning to melt. Well, my young friends, there's a man standing behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this man is none other than his blood uncle Abu Lahab. His sakka chacha, his chacha Abu Lahab is standing behind him. And whenever Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa would invite the people to the kalima la ilaha illallah, his own blood uncle would say to the masses, kinay, innahu sabi, innahu kadhib. Oh, people do not listen to this man. He's a sabian. He's a liar. I know him better than you can ever know him. He's my own blood nephew. This is my nephew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever Rasulullah would invite the people to the kalima la ilaha illallah, his own blood uncle would turn the masses away from him and accuse him of being a liar and a sabian and would say to them, I know him better than you can ever know him. He's my blood nephew. And then he would pick up stones and he would begin to pelt the blessed feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, causing the blessed feet of Rasulullah to be covered in blood and to bleed. I ask you, my young friends, how do you think our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam must have felt when this is how he was received by his own, by his blood uncle? The very man that he felt that he could rely upon. My young friends, our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born a yateem. أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى وَوَجَدَكَ أَعْئِلًا فَأَغْنَى He was born as a yateem. Allah took away his father before he ever came into the dunya. And Allah took away his mother when he was still a child. Allah took away his grandfather Abdul Muttalib when he was still a child. His uncle Abu Talib that would help him, Allah took him away. My young friends, he was a yateem. When a person is a yatim, when a person is born an orphan, who does he resort to for help? Who does he turn to for help? He turns to his uncles. He turns to his chacha from his father's side. He'll turn to his mother's side. He'll turn to his relatives. Okay, maybe if Allah's taken away my mother. Maybe if Allah's taken away my father. Maybe if Allah's taken away my grandfather, my grandmother. I have chachas which are alive. I have uncles which are alive. I have cousins which are alive. I will turn to them. Maybe they will help me. Maybe they will support me. I believe that our beloved Nabi Sallallahu must have felt like this. When Allah burdened him with this responsibility, Ketika Allah has taken away my father, but Abu Jahl is alive. Abu Lahab is alive. Abu Talib is alive. Maybe they will help me in conveying this message. Maybe will they, they will help me. They will support me. They will comfort me. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt? That the very people in which he had hope, hope in were the biggest enemies of Allah and his Rasul. The biggest enemies of Islam. Never mind embracing him, helping him, supporting him. They were turning people away and they were covering, they were pelting him with stones and covering his body in blood from head to toe. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt when this is the one that he was received with? How would you feel? The likes of Walid would insult. He would belittle our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he would say to Rasulullah, huh, couldn't Allah find anyone better than you for prophethood? Were you the only guy on the dunya that Allah could see to choose an honor with prophethood? Do you receive the revelation? 
Whereas I am the leader of the Quraysh and the chief of the Quraysh. Allah has left me and Allah has chosen you. My young friends, from verbal persecution, it now intensifies to physical persecution. The persecution intensifies from verbal to physical. And how do they begin? They begin by belittling our beloved Nabi Muhammad By making him feel so small, insignificant, not important. That way, people will not listen to him. People will not become inclined towards him. They made him feel so small and so ins insignificant. Nabi Karim وسلم, is walking. A man from the Quraysh comes and he covers Rasulullah from head to toe in dust and dirt. Making Nabi Karim وسلم, feel so small, helpless. Nabi Karim وسلم, returns home. His daughter, on seeing that her father is covered in dust and dirt, tears are flowing from her eyes. She's crying bitterly. She embraces her father and she begins to wipe away the dust and dirt. And Nabi Karim وسلم, clings on to his daughter and says, Ya Bunaya, la tabki, fa inna Allah maniun abad. Oh my daughter, do not cry. Indeed, Allah one day will protect your father. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt on that day? When in the presence of his own children, they would belittle him, they would make him feel powerless they would make him feel as if he's someone so low that we can do anything to him we can walk all over him there will nobody to support him and to help him how would you feel my young friend if you're walking with three four of your children and somebody belittles you somebody insults you in this manner in the presence of your children and you're in such a position that you cannot do anything you cannot say anything how would that make you feel in front of your own children? And what would, they, what would your children think with regards to their father? Okay, look how weak our father is. That he can't do anything when people behave towards him in this manner. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt when they walked over Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Who do you treat in this manner? Just pick up dust and dirt. You throw dust and dirt on people that you know can't react. You know they can't do anything. You know they will not be able to beat you or grab you by the neck and push you to one side. These are the type of people that you walk all over. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt when this is how he was received by the people of Makkah? You read on a regular basis. Why were these verses of the Quran revealed? Doesn't Allah refer, refer to the wife of Abu Lahab, Umm Jameel? Whenever the Nabi Kareem Wasallam would go out, she would put thorns and items in the path of Rasulullah. And objective was to cause injury and harm to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even when he stood before the Almighty Allah in prayer, they wouldn't allow him to worship Allah. They wouldn't allow him to stand before the Almighty Allah and pray in peace. Nabi Karim Wasallam is standing before the Almighty Allah in prayer. And a group from the Quraysh are sitting next to the Holy Kaaba besides Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they have the fetus of a camel. This impurity, this najasat. And one of them says to the others, who will take this fetus of this camel? and place it on the back of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uqba the wretched volunteers. And when our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam falls in prostration, this wretched man takes this impurity, the fetus of this camel, this najasat and this impurity and places it on the pure back of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So much so that our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he's bowing there, bowing down in prostration, glorifying Allah, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, cannot raise his head from prostration because of the impurity of this fetus on his blessed back. And he remains in prostration till his daughter realizes what they've done to her father. And she run comes running, rushing, and she takes off this impurity 
from the blessed back of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whenever he would bow down, whenever he would stand before the Almighty Allah and worship Allah, they wouldn't allow him to worship Allah in peace. Another occasion, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is standing before the Almighty Allah in prayer, next to Maqam Ibrahim, and the leaders of the Quraysh are sitting in the shade of the Holy Kaaba, seeing that Muhammad is all alone. He's focusing on his Lord. And this is a golden opportunity to kill him, to put an end to him, to put an end to the Quran, to put an end to Islam. They decide to kill Rasulullah while he's in prayer. And again, the Uqba, Uqba the wretched, advances towards Rasulullah and he begins to strangle the Nabi of Allah in prayer with his sheet of cloth. Nabi Karim Wasallam is being strangled. He can barely breathe. He can barely breathe. He comes crashing to the ground unconscious and the kuffar begin to shout and cry that Muhammad has been killed. Muhammad has been killed. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, when he realizes what they're they doing to his beloved friend Muhammad sallallahu he leaves what he's doing and he comes rushing to rescue our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with tears flowing from his eyes, he says to them, O kafiro, ataqtuluna rajlun an yaqula rabbi Allah. Are you killing him? Because he says, la ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy of worship but Allah. Are you killing this man because he's inviting people to the one Allah? He's inviting people to the Tawheed and the one Allah. Are you killing him only because of this reason? Even when he was in the privacy of his own home, you would think they would let him be. My young friends, even when he was inside the four walls of his house, they wouldn't allow him to pray in peace. Nabi Karim وسلم, is prostrating before the Almighty Allah and a kafir brings the uterus of a goat and he places it on the back of Muhammad whilst the other one takes pieces of this uterus and places it in the pots and pants of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who can forget what happened to our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he went to Ta'if. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leaves the people of Makkah and he makes his way to Ta'if. Okay, maybe if the people of Makkah didn't embrace Rasulullah and were not prepared to embrace him, to support him, to believe in the one Allah, maybe the people of Ta'if will embrace him. Maybe the people of Ta'if will declare the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And with this hope, the Nabi of Allah leaves Makkah al Makarramah and makes his way to Ta'if. Rasulullah sallam, is so desperate to save the people of Ta'if from the fire of hell. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa is so desperate to take out the people of Ta'if from the darkness of Kufr in the light of Islam. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa meets with the lead, leaders of Ta'if and Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks to them. He tells them about the oneness of Allah. He tells them about the greatness of Allah. He tells them about the beauty of Islam and the beauty of the Quran. My young friends, the leaders and the chiefs of Taif are not interested in, in Islam. They belittle him and they insult him. One of the chiefs says, Huh, I swear by the idols, Latun Uzza, if Allah has sent you as a Nabi, I will steal the kiswa, the ghila, the cloth of the holy Kaaba. The other one says, La ukallimuka abada. I have got time for you. I will not even speak to you. I will not even give you the time of the day. The third one insults Rasulullah. He couldn't Allah find anyone other than you to send as a Nabi. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa realizes that the people of Taif and the chiefs of Taif are not interested in Allah. Are not interested in the kalima la ilaha illallah. And as a result, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa leaves Taif with my young friends. They do not allow the Nabi of Allah to leave Taif in peace. My young friends, they set the local gangsters, the street urchins against Rasulullah. And these local gangsters come and they hiss, they hoop, they, jeer, they, they jeer, they belittle, they swear, and they pick up stones. And as our beloved Nabi Karim وسلم, is leaving Taif, they begin to pelt Nabi Karim وسلم's blessed body with stones. Stones are being showered upon Rasulullah. They're hitting him from all directions. There are stones which are landing on his blessed head. There are stones which are landing on his blessed face. There are stones which are landing on his hands, his forearms, his thigh, his chest, his legs. Every time he took a step, 
they showered him with stones. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is covered in blood from head to toe. So much blood that our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can barely walk. His shoes are clogged onto his feet. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't know what's hit him. Doesn't know what's happened. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in the state of shock as these stones are being showered upon him. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this state leaves Taif and as he's left Taif, he turns to the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi and he began, begins to beg for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turns to Allah and Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes this dua. Ki oh Allah, Allahumma ilayka ashku du'fa quwwati wa killata hilati wa hawani ala nas ya arham al-rahimin anta rabb al-musad'afin anta rabbi ila man takilni ila ba'idin yatajahamuni am ila aduwin malaktahu amri in lam yakun bika aliya ghadamun fala ubali walakin afiyatak hiya awsa'u li a'udhu bi nuri wajhik alladhi ashraqat lahu dhulamat wa saluha aliya amru dunya wal akhira min an yanzil bi ghadabu wa yuhilla aliya sakhadu lakal utba hatta tarda wala hawla wala kuwata illa bik Allahumma ilayka ashku du'fu kuwati oh Allah I'm complaining about my weakness oh Allah I'm weak oh Allah I'm complaining about my insignificance in the eyes of people Oh Allah, I'm complaining about it, my inability to convey the message. Oh Allah, it is not the fault of the people of Taif. Oh Allah, it's the fault of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even then, when Rasulullah was showered with stones from head to toe and covered in blood that he can barely walk, my young friends, he did not blame the people of Taif. He blamed himself and he's telling Allah, okay Allah, it's not their fault, the people of Taif. It's my fault, the fault of Muhammad. Oh Allah, I'm weak. Oh Allah, I don't know how to convey the message as the message should be conveyed. Oh Allah, I'm insignificant in the eyes of people. Oh Allah, Anta Rahamur Rahimeen. You are the most merciful and you are the most kind. Anta Rabbul Musadafeen. You are the Lord of the weak. Oh Allah, you are my Lord. Who are you abandoning me to? Oh Allah, are you abandoning me, uh, abandoning me to a distant relative to, to whom you've given? control over my affairs or to some enemy. Oh Allah, I don't care. Oh Allah, as long as you are happy with me. Oh Allah, as long as you are not angry with me. Oh Allah, as long as you are happy with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, I don't care. These people can strip the flesh of my body. Oh Allah, they can cook me in pieces. Oh Allah, I don't, I don't, I don't care what happens to me. As long as you're happy and as long you are not angry with me. Oh Allah, I don't care. This prayer was so powerful, my young friends. When he turned to the Almighty Allah and begged, Allahumma ilayka ashku du'fa kuwati, get there and then Jibreel appears before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jibreel Amin appears before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Jibreel Amin says to our beloved Nabi, Inna Allah kad samia qawla qawmik lak wa ma raddu alayh. Ya Rasulullah, Allah knows, Allah has heard what these people of Taif said to you. Allah knows how they've dealt with you. Allah knows of their response. Ya Rasulullah, the angel of the mountain will appear here and now. Order him as you please. The angel of the mountain appears before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the angel of the mountain says to the Nabi of Allah, Ki Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah kal samiya qawla qawmidak. Allah knows what they've done. Allah has heard their response. Ya Rasulullah, I'm here. Order me as you please. If you wish, I can collide these two mountains overlooking Taif. And the people of Taif will be history. They'll be turned to dust, my young friends. All Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needs to do, he doesn't even need to do, utter a word. All Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needs to do is raise an eyebrow, give an isha'ala, give some sort of indication. And within a zillionth of a second, the angel will collide these two mountains overlooking Taif. And the people of Taif will be no more. The people of Taif will be history. The people of Taif will turn to dust and dirt. Oh my young friends, the Quran described our beloved Nabi. Inna ka la ala khulukin azim. Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your character is sublime. Oh Muhammad, you are something special. You are something different. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. You are a mercy for the believing kind and for the enemy kind. My young friends, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responds. Bal arju an yukhrij Allahu min aslabihim. Even those, these people have showered me with spoons. I still have hope in the Almighty Allah that if not today, in a week's time, if not in a week's time, a month, if not in a month, a year, five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years time, I still have hope in the Almighty Allah that one day Allah will take out from the very people that have showered me with stones. Allah will take out from their progeny 
those that will declare la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah how do you think the nabi of allah must have felt on the day of taif rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself would say there was never a day more severe which i experienced than the day of taif how do you think nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam must have felt that day when this was the hospitality that he received from the people of taif my young friends the persecution doesn't come to an end every moment it just gets worse and worse and worse it intensifies when the people of makka realize this is the resolve of this man that this man will never bow down no matter whether we call him majnoon whether we call him sa'ir sha'ir asatir al awwalin whether we belittle him whether we make him feel helpless whether we beat him and shower with him stone this man is too strong from within this man will not doubt bow down to pressure my young friends they decide now to paralyze rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but how do you paralyze a man with a strong resolve a man that is not prepared to leave the kalima a man that is not prepared to bow down to pressure a man that even if they place the sun and moon and the entire dunya in his right hand is not prepared to let go of the kalima la ilaha illallah how do you paralyze such an individual my young friends people that are strong from within that have a strong personality that are strong will power the way you paralyze them is by attacking the family members no matter how strong a person is himself when you attack his family members and when you blackmail him with regards to his daughters his wife his mother the female members of his family my young friends no matter how strong a person may be himself when you blackmail him with regards to persecuting or raping his family members the strongest of men will bow down to pressure the strongest of men will dance to the tune that you sing once you blackmail them and once you attack their female members of his family the strongest of men will bow down this is now the tactic that these people use they attack his family members they come to the two sons of abu lahab and the two sons of abu lahab were married to the daughters of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they say to the two sons of abu lahab o oh sons of abu lahab you have taken the burden of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by marrying his daughters you've you've taken the burden of muhammad divorce them send them back to him let him be burdened with them let him be occupied with them and my young friends the daughters of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are divorced why because their father declares the kalima la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah i ask i ask you my young friend put yourself in that position how would you feel if your daughters were divorced my young friends it would not be an exaggeration for me to say that is the worst nightmare for any father that has daughters that is the worst nightmare for any parent the day their daughter comes back to tell them that she's been divorced by her husband it kills any mother and father from within because you know when you marry your daughter you send her from your house you send her with this intention that she will never ever return single and back to your house divorced you send her for life you never even dream this dream that your daughter will come back this is why when she separates your house your heart melts it's like as if she's dead she's died it would kill the strongest of men if his daughter were to be sent back divorced and then if you as a father were to realize you know what your son in law divorce your daughter because of no fault of your daughter there was no weakness in your daughter there was no such thing that she was not good looking 
There was no such thing that she was disobedient. She took care of her husband in every regard. But in spite of that, she was divorced. My young friends, that would kill the best of men. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt on that day? When two, not one, two of his daughters were divorced. Not because they were disobedient. Not because they were not good looking. Not because they didn't take care of their husbands. Only because their father declared, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. To have a go at Muhammad, they punished his daughters. How do you think Nabi of Allah must have felt on that day? My young friends, look what they did to his daughter Zainab. Zainab is in Makkah al Makarrama. And our beloved Nabi Karim وسلم, is in Medina al Manawwara. Battle of Badr takes place. The Kuffar have been defeated. 70 have been captured. And 70 have been imprisoned. And one of those that has been taken prisoner is a man called Abu al-As. Abu al-As was the husband of Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah. He was a son-in-law of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's been taken prisoner. He's from amongst the 70 men that have been captured in Badr. As that Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anhu sends a necklace in ransom for the release of her husband Abu al-As. And the necklace that she sent for the release of her husband Abu al-As was the necklace that her mother Khatija gave her when she got married to Abu al-As. And when our beloved Nabi Karim وسلم, received the necklace of Zainab, which his wife Khatija had given to Zainab at the time of marriage, Tears began to flow from the eyes of Rasulullah. Nabi Karim وسلم, couldn't bear to see this necklace. Why? Because it reminded him of Khatija. And who was Khatija? My young friends, Khatija was no ordinary woman. If our beloved Nabi loved Aisha and he loved Aisha so much that whenever Rasulullah وسلم, was asked, Man ahabbu nasi ilayk. Whenever he was asked the million dollar question, Ya Rasulullah, who do you love most of all? I ask you, my young friends, what was the response of Rasulullah? Whenever he was asked, who do you love most of all? There was only ever one answer. From the men, he would mention Abu Bakr. And from the women, he would mention Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. This was the love that Rasulullah had for Aisha. But how much love do you think he had for Khatija? Let me tell you, my young friends. Whenever the Nabi of Allah slaughtered a goat, he would make sure that he gave some of the meat of this goat to the friends of Aisha, from, to the friends of Khatija, just because of their connection with our mother, Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Years have passed, Khatija has died. Whenever he slaughtered a lamb, a goat, a sheep, he would send meat from this goat to the friends of Khatija that were alive just because of their connection with his wife Khatija. If this is the love that he had for Khatija, that he never forgot the friends of Khatija, then how much love do you think he must have had Khatija herself? Whenever... Throughout his life, the Nabi of Allah never forgot Khatija. That throughout his life, till his last breath, Nabi Karim وسلم, would always remember the favors of Khatija. And he would always mention them. And he would always mention her so much, so much, that he would annoy his beloved Aisha. And as Aisha would say to Rasulullah, Ki Ya Rasulullah, for how long will you mention this old woman when Allah has given you better women? And she would refer to herself because she was the only virgin that our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married by Allah's command. She would say, Ya Rasulullah, for how long will you mention, remember this old woman when Allah has given you a better woman? 
And Nabi Kareem وسلم, would put us straight and say, Oh Aisha, indeed you are my beloved. But I swear by Allah, Ma abdalani Allah khayran minha. Allah did not give me a woman better than Khatija. Oh Aisha, amanat bihina kafran nas. When the entire dunya rejected Muhammad, when they would insult him, when they would belittle him, when they would say he's insane and a madman, when they would say he's a poet and a magician, when they would say he relates Jack and Oris, when the entire dunya rejected Muhammad, or oh Aisha, it was only Khatija and Khatija alone that embraced Muhammad. And when the dunya deprived Muhammad, it was Khatija that said, Labbaik wa sa'daik wal khayru fi yadaik ke ya Rasulallah, this is my mal, this is my wealth, it is at your disposal. She showered me with her blessings. O oh, Aisha, Allah has not given me a woman better than her. All my children, it was Khadija that gave me these children. She gave me Fatima, she gave me Umm Kulsum, she gave me Ruqiyah, she gave me Qasim Tayyib Tahir. O oh, Aisha, Allah has not given me a woman better than Khadija. So when he received this necklace naturally, it melted the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi And Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam began to cry. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, they were prepared to lay their lives for the Nabi of Allah. They couldn't tolerate to see Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam crying. And unanimously they all agree that Abu al-Abbas will be released. And he will be released without ransom, without any payment. On one condition, that when Abu al-Aas returns to Makkah, he will send the daughter of Rasulullah Zainab to her father in Medina al Munawwara. Abu al-Aas is re released. He goes back to Makkah. And he honors his word. He goes back to Makkah and he says to his brother Kanana or Kanana, take Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah to Medina. The Muslims are waiting outside Makkah al Makarramah to receive her and to take her to her dear father. Kanana leaves with Zainab to take her to the Muslims waiting outside Makkah. One way or another, the Quraysh come to know. They send an army to intercept the daughter of Rasulullah. A man called Habbar ibn Aswad flings a spear at the daughter of Rasulullah while she was pregnant. She was expecting, she was riding a camel. The spear hits the daughter of Rasulullah and injures her. She falls crashing to the ground and she loses the child. And she herself, as a result of the same injuries, dies in the eighth year of Hijrah. I ask you, my young friends, how do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt on that day? When he received the news of the injury of his daughter Zainab. When he received the news that his grandchild died because of the actions of the people of Makkah, Habbar ibn Aswad. How do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt on that day when this is how they dealt with his daughter Zainab radiallahu ta'ala The persecution doesn't come to an end, it now intensifies. Not only the people, not only the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Seventh year of prophethood and then there's a social ban. Every person connected to Rasulullah is driven out from their homes and they're forced to take refuge in the cave of, in the gorge of Abu Talib, in the shape of Abu Talib, in the cave of the mountain. And the kuffar have decided it's a boycott, embargo. They will not marry anyone from the family of Rasulullah, from the Banu Hashim. They will not buy anything from the tribe of Banu Hashim. They will not sell anything to the tribe of Banu Hashim. They will stop any food reaching the Banu Hashim. This is how they will paralyze and they will cripple the family of Rasulullah and the believing army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ban comes into effect. And the people and the family of Rasulullah and the believers have nothing to eat. And the children are crying, screaming, shouting, suffering from starvation. The ban is not lifted. So much so, my young friend, that the, the Muslims have nothing to eat. They're literally eat, taking leaves from trees and they're sustaining themselves on leaves. This was the circumstance. 
listen to the great Muslim general Sa'd ibn Waqqas, the uncle of Rasulullah. He's talking about whilst the Muslims were inside this cave. He says on one occasion, I came out to relieve myself, looking for a place to relieve myself. He says, I came across some camel skin, dry camel skin. I found some camel skin, I took it and I began to mash it till this camel skin became powder. And then when it became powder, camel skin, I took some water and I ate it with water and I sustained myself. I lived on this water, powdered camel skin with water for three days. This is what I survived on. The Muslims live like this, my young friends, not for a day or two, not for a week or two, not for a month or two. Three years, this is how Rasulullah and the believers lived in the cave of Abu Talib. You'd think now they would leave Muhammad وسلم, but no, it doesn't come to an end. Now the persecution intensifies so much that the Muslims are forced to migrate to Ethiopia. Rasulullah himself is now forced to migrate to Mecca, migrate Mecca to, from migrate from Mecca to Medina to Manawara. How do you think Rasulullah must have felt on the day when he's forced to leave the very same city and town in which he was born? When he was forced to leave the house of Allah? When he was forced to leave the Haram of Mecca, the blessed place of Sayyidina Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, how do you think he must have felt? He leaves Mecca and now migrates to Medina to Munawwara. And now you would think, my friends, that the Kuffar of Mecca would leave Rasulullah. But no. He's in Medina to Munawwara. And even then, they don't allow him to live in peace. They send an army of a thousand strong men in Badr. And this army has the latest weapons of the time. They have the horses, they have the camels, they have the swords. The believers are a mere 313. Their condition is so pitiful that many of them are carrying sticks. They don't even have swords. They don't even have hardly any camels. They don't hardly have any horses. They're carrying swords. Some of them don't even have shoes to wear. Their condition is so pitiful that Nabi Karim وسلم, is crying, is standing before the Almighty Allah in prayer. He spent the entire night in prayer and he's begging for Allah's mercy. Allahumma innahum jiyaun fashbi'hum innahum hufatun innahum uratun faksuhum innahum hufatun fahmilhum Oh Allah, they're barefooted, mount them. Oh Allah, they're naked, clothe them. Oh Allah, they're hungry, feed them. He's begging for Allah's mercy. He's crying so much that the outer garment of Rasulullah falls onto the ground. And Abu Bakr clings onto the Nabi of Allah and says, Ya Rasulullah, enough is enough. You begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too much. Allah will not humiliate you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not disgrace you. The Muslims are victorious. Badr comes to an end. My young friends, a year passes and this time the kuffar sent. 3,000 men to defeat the Muslims and momentarily, momentarily they get an over, upper hand upon the believers. Nabi Karim Wasallam condition is such that blood, his face has been injured. Blood is flowing from his face. His tooth has become shaheed and the words are flowing from his lips. How can a people be successful that have injured the face of their Nabi? Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innum la ya'lamun Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innum la ya'lamun Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innum la ya'lamun Oh Allah forgive my people for they know not Oh Allah forgive my people for they know not Oh Allah forgive my people for they know not Doesn't come to an end After Uhud my young friends the kuffar Begin to mutilate the shuhada of Uhud The martyrs of Uhud They take off their, they take their knives and take off their noses they cut off their ears, they cut off their, they cut, they, they cut open their stomachs. Him, the wife of Abu Sufyan, makes her way to the body of Sayyidina Hamza, the uncle of Rasulullah. And she cuts off his flesh. She cuts off his ears, his nose, his lips. She cuts open his stomach. She takes out his liver. And she begins to chew the liver 
of Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And not only did she chew the liver of Hamza, my young friends, thereafter she makes a necklace out of this flesh that she has in her hands. And she wears this necklace around her neck and rejoices that today I've taken revenge. I ask you, my young friends, how do you think the Nabi of Allah must have felt on that day? His near and dear uncle, his favorite uncle, Sayyidina Hamza, his liver has been chewed, his flesh has been cut, and a necklace has been made and worn by a woman called Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan. How do you think Rasulullah was must have felt? Nabi Karim wasallam was so affected by the death of his uncle Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an that my young friends, he read the janazah again and again and again. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa would offer the janazah of a sahabi and would offer the janazah of Sayyidina Hamza. The sahaba would come and say, Ya Rasulullah, allow us to take the janazah of Hamza and allow us to bury him. And Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa would say, no, take this sahabi. We do not take the janazah, the body of my uncle Sayyidina Hamza. The sahaba would bring another sahabi. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa would offer the janazah of that sahabi. And again, he would offer the janazah of Hamza. The Sahaba would come to take the janazah of Hamza. And again, Rasulullah would say, Kinebai, you can't take my uncle. And Rasulullah would cry. A third Sahabi would be brought. Rasulullah would offer the janazah of that Sahabi. And again, he would offer the janazah of Hamza. And again, they would say, Ya Rasulullah, allow us to take Hamza. And again, Rasulullah would say, No. Rasulullah offered the janazah of Hamza again and again and again. So much so that in the narration it is mentioned that Nabi Karim وسلم, offered the janazah of Hamza on that day 70 times. This is how much affected Rasulullah was. It was only when Allah sent Jibreel Amin from the heavens and said, Kitel Muhammad, I've written of, on the arsh of Allah that Hamza is a lion of Allah. Did Nabi Karim وسلم, get some peace of mind? How do you think he must have felt? It doesn't come to an end, my young friends. A year or you a two passes. Now, all the Arabs of Arabia have united and have come and surrounded Medina to Manawara to put an end to the Nabi of Allah, to put an end to Islam and Quran. So much so, my young friends, that Nabi Karim وسلم, is forced to dig a trench to protect himself and the believers from the invading armies of Arabia. It is bitterly cold, freezing. The Sahaba are suffering from starvation. So much so that the Sahaba have stones tied to their stomachs due to hunger. The Nabi of Allah himself has two stones tied to his stomach due to hunger. And in this condition, hunger and freezing bitterly cold, Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is digging the trench. The condition of the believers is so bad that Allah describes it in the Quran. بَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبَ الْحَنَاجِرِ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ هُنَالِكَ بْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا It continues for years on end. 21 years. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received from the people of Makkah. Now I ask you, my young friends, the million dollar question. How do you think Nabi Karim وسلم, received these very same people that behaved and treated him in this manner when Makkah was conquered in the eighth year of Hijrah? What did history record? What will you find in the books of Hadith? What will you find in the books of history? This is what you will find, my young friends. Nabi Karim وسلم, walks into Makkah al Makarrama with an army of 10,000 men. An army so big that prior to this, the Muslims in their his entire history had not seen such a great army. The likes of Abu Bakr is there. The likes of Umar is there. Talha, Zubair, Sa'ad, Sa'id, the great companions of Rasulullah, Bilal, Khabbab, are all behind Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 10,000 men heading towards Makkah al -Mukarrama. They enter the Haram. They enter Masjid al-Haram. The Kuffar are standing in Masjid al-Haram. They're shivering and shaking like never before because they can see Rasulullah. They know what they did over a period of 21 years to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
They know what they did to his daughter Zainab. They know what they did to his daughters. They know what they did to the believers. They know what they did to the likes of Khabbab. They know what they did to the likes of Bilal. They can see them. They're shivering and shaking like never before. Nabi Karim وسلم, walked to the house of Allah and he meets with the chief of Quraysh and he asks them the million dollar question. He tell me, Maza taqulun? What do you think Muhammad وسلم, will do with you here and now? What do you think? Maza taqulun? What do you have to say? What do you think Muhammad وسلم, will do here and now? I ask you, my young friends, what do you think was their response? Let me tell you of their response. It seems like some from amongst the kuffar in the days of the Jahiliyyah, at the time of Makkah was conquered, they knew our beloved Nabi better than you and I know Rasulullah today. Even though we declared the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It seems to me as if some of those at the time that were not believers knew our beloved Nabi better than you and I know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam today. My young friends, in spite of what they did to Muhammad, in spite of the fact that they persecuted, they belittled, they tormented, they tortured him, his family members, the believers for 21 years. Well, my young friends, when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked them the million dollar question, what do you think that I'm going to do with you, my young friends? They still replied, Nadhunu khayran. Oh Muhammad, we still have hope. They knew, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْآلِمِينَ They knew of the verse of the Qur'an. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a mercy for mankind. They knew, إِنَّكَ لَا أَلَىٰ خُلُكٍ أَذِيمٍ Muhammad is something special. Muhammad is something different. Muhammad is not like the average man. Muhammad is far and beyond. And in spite of the fact that what they did with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they knew from the bottom of their heart, Muhammad will not receive them in the manner that they receive Muhammad. This is why, in spite of all the wrong that they did, when they were asked, when they were questioned, when they were confronted, they said, Nazunnu khairan. Oh Muhammad, if we were standing in front of any other person in the dunya, it may have been, it may have been something different. It might have been something else. But oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're not standing in front of anyone else. We're standing in front of you. The very person regarding which the Quran says, the very person regarding which the Quran describes, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad, we have hope for hope, we hope for good. Akhun Kareem, you are a noble brother. Wabnu Akhin Kareem, you are the son of the noble brother. My young friends, if it were you and I, we would have killed every single Makkan. We would have stripped his skin from his body. Rivers of blood would have flown in the valleys of Makkah. And even then would have said, Amara kileja thanda nahi hua. You know what? We haven't taken justice. We, ha we haven't taken revenge. Oh well, my young friends, this was not you and me. This was our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He lived up to there. But, but he lived up to his reputation and beyond. My young friends. And he said to the people of Makkah, Oh people of Makkah, I say to you as Yusuf said to his brothers when they wronged him, La tathriba alaykum al -yawm. No harm will come to you today. No reproach. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has freed every single one of you. Do as you please. No harm will come to you. Nobody will say as much as off to you. He freed every single Makkan, my young friends, as a result of such interaction and behavior, conduct and character and personality, my young friends. One by one in their hundreds, these very same people of Makkah that persecuted him for over 21 years, they came and one by one they would utter, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasoonallah that I testify there is no God worthy worship of Allah and I testify Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger. One by one, they came in their hundreds and declared the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. He was a friend to his enemy. Never mind the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala najma'een, the believing kind. My young friends, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was a mercy for even those that didn't believe. For those that would harm him, 
Not once did Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam take ever, ever, ever did he take revenge for any harm that came to his blessed person. The hadith of Bukhari comes to mind. A Jew by the name of Labid ibn al-Aqsam practiced magic on Rasulullah. And as a result of this magic, the influence of this magic, our beloved Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam felt he'd done something, whereas in reality he hadn't done that thing. This was all as a result of the influence of this magic. And this is the worst type of magic. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was informed by Allah who cast this spell. And at the same time, our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was informed how to display, dispel the influence of this spell. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was cured. When he was cured, our mother Azad Aisha radiallahu ta'ala who said to Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you punish this guy? Why don't you take him to account? Why don't you hold him to account? And our beloved Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, Oh Aisha, Allah has cured me. I don't like to spread evil amongst my people. The narrator of this hadith says, I saw the very same person that did magic on Rasulullah. He would attend the gatherings of Rasulullah after this. Not once did the Nabi of Allah ever mention this to this individual. Okay, by I know you are the one that did magic on me. And no could you tell from the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa was annoyed with this individual when he would attend the gatherings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was my beloved Nabi, my young friends. Whoever, whoever came to the Nabi of Allah with a clean heart, my young friends, he, you know, the interaction, the warmth that he would receive from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the akhlaq and character that he would witness, my young friends, he did not leave that gathering without declaring the kalima, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Any person that came into the gathering of Rasulullah with a clean heart looking for haqq, looking for the truth, he would not leave. When he would meet Rasulullah, he would not leave that gathering without de declaring the kalima, la ilaha illallah. Hadith comes to mind. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is returning from a campaign. And it was the practice of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the practice of the Sahaba, that they would leave the tree that gave the most shade for the Nabi of Allah, so that he could rest under this, take his siesta and taking Qailula under this tree. So they were returning from a campaign, there was a particular tree. They left this tree for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it gave a beautiful shade. And the Sahaba dispersed far and wide looking for trees under which they could sleep. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came under this tree, took off his armor, took off his sword and hung it on one of the branches. The Sahaba have dispersed far and wide. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is resting. Now a man by the name of Ghawrath, he comes and he takes the sword of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sleeping. And he places the sword of Rasulullah on the neck of Rasulullah. And he addresses the Nabi of Allah. Man yamna'uka minni, O Muhammad, tell me, who will protect you from me? The sword is in his hand. It is on the neck of Rasulullah. And he's asking, O Muhammad, tell me, who will now save you from me? Who will protect you from me? The Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responds, look at his Iman, look at his Yaqeen, look at the reliance upon Allah. The sword is in his hands, it is on the neck of Allah. But in spite of this, Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah will protect me. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam utters the word Allah, the sword falls. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam takes the sword, places it on his neck and says, okay, now you tell me who will protect you from me. Now you tell me who will protect you from, from me. He begins, he begins to beg for mercy. Ya Rasul, I beg you, set me free, let me be. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, testify there is no God worthy of worship of Allah and I am Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. He says, no. I'm not prepared to believe. The very same man that a minute ago was prepared to take the neck of Rasul Allah. He's begging for mercy. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks him, declare the kalima. He's not prepared to declare, declare the kalima, la ilaha illallah. Yet a minute ago, he was prepared to, 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 to take off the neck of Rasulullah and to kill Rasulullah 
Now he's begging for mercy. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says him, declared the kalam, he says, no. But I will promise you that I will never fight you again. And no will I ever side the people that fight you. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sets him free. Okay, go Ghawras. No harm will come to you. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sets you free. My young friends, Ghawras returns to his people and says to his people, yo people, I've just come from a man called Muhammad. I've never seen a man in the dunya better than Muhammad. In some narration, it mentions that Ghawras declares the kalima la ilaha illallah. And because of his declaring the kalima la ilaha illallah, hundreds of people from his tribe declare the kalima la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. This was Muhammad. Whoever met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa such was the impact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would have on hearts and minds that the person wouldn't leave the gathering without declaring the kalima la ilaha illallah. My young friends, I've just given you one example. I can spend the entire night giving you example of people that when they interacted with Rasulullah, they declared the kalima la ilaha illallah. Who can forget the hadith of Sahih Muslim? The narrator says that Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala, again, what a beautiful hadith. Ba'ath al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khaylan qibla najd. On one occasion, the Nabi of Allah sends a small cavalry unit towards Najd. And a man from Najd is captured called Sumamat ibn Usal. He's tied to one of the pillars of the masjid. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to meet Sumama. And Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again asked him the million dollar question. Ma indaka ya Sumama. What do you think I'm going to do with you? What do you think was the response of Sumama? You know, this is why I keep on saying, it seems to me as if some from amongst the kuffar at the time of Rasulullah bet knew our Rasul better than you and I seem to know him today. Sumama ibn Athal is an enemy. He's been captured by the believers. He's a prisoner inside the masjid. He's been tied to the pillar. And when Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him the million dollar question, what do you think I'm going to do with you? Look at his response. Shouldn't Sumama be shivering and shaking that Muhammad is going to take my neck? He's going to kill me. I'm an enemy. No, my young friends. He's so comfortable. The enemy is so comfortable with Rasulullah that he's saying, in the khair, ya Muhammad. Oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have a good thought. I have a good opinion with regards to you. And then he says, in taqtulni taqtul zadam. If you kill me, then I'm a killer. I'm worthy of being killed. When tunim tunim ala shakir. And if you show kindness, you will show kindness to a man that will be grateful. When kunda taridul mal fasal minu ma'shid. And if you're looking for mal, if you're looking for dollars and dimes, then ask for whatever you like. It will be given to you. It will be at your disposal. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let him be. He didn't say anything to him. Next day, again Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to Thumama. And again he asked him, Ma'indaka yu Thumama, what do you think I'm going to do with you? And again Thumama gave exactly the same answer. Yo Muhammad, in taktulni taktul zadam, when tunim tunim ala shakir, when kunta turidul mal fasalu min ma'ashid. Again Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let him be. Third day, again Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him the same question, oh, oh Thumama, what do you think I'm going to do? And again, Uthamama said, Oh Muhammad, I'm comfortable. I'm at ease. I've got, I've, I have a good idea with regards to you. If you kill me, then I'm worthy of being killed. I'm a killer. And if you show kindness, then I will be grateful. And if you want mal, ask for it. I will give it to you. My young friends, third day, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to the Sahaba, Atriku Samama, set him free. Let him go. Samama, you're free to go. My young friends, how can it be that somebody spends three days in the company of Rasulullah with a clean heart? Doesn't declare the kalima la ilaha illallah. Is not affected by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Is not influenced by Nabi of Allah. It can't happen. So Mama goes to a nearby orchard near the masjid. He takes a bath. He'd been in the gathering of Rasulullah three days. He was able to see Nabi Karim sallallahu wasallam from close. The way he spoke with the Sahaba. The warmth. The mercy, the compassion, the love, the way he dealt with the believers, my young friends. It had such an impact on the heart of Sumama that he takes a bath. Even though Nabi of Allah said, Sumama, you're free, you can go. He takes a bath. He comes back in the gathering of Rasulullah and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anaka Rasulullah. 
that I testify there is no God worthy worship but Allah. And I testify you Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa truly is the messenger of Allah. Not only does he declare the karima, I want you to listen to the next words. Look at the impact our beloved Nabi had on hearts and minds. Why is it that you and I don't have that same impact today? Why is it that we have no impact on anyone? How long have you been living on this land? What, 100 years, 150 years your fathers came? Why is it to this day, only a handful of believer natives have declared the karima la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah? Why is it people are not influenced by what you have to offer? I mean, I live in a place called England. We've been there since 1950. We've been there for over 60, 65 years. And if you walk inside our masjid, you'll only find Desi people. People from the subcontinent, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. You will not find white looking people. You will not find white British people. You will not find native people. Why is it that the white people today have not declared the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? What is it about us? We number in our millions, there are over 3 million Muslims in England. There's over 100,000 Muslims here in this small island of Trinidad. You've been here for over 150 years. Why is it that people, when they interact with you, when they talk with you, when they deal with you, they do not utter the kalima la ilaha in Allah. Whereas Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was only one man. Yet hundreds and thousands declared the kalima la ilaha in Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Not only did they declare the kalima la ilaha in Allah, my new friends, from the moment they were declared the kalima la ilaha in Allah, they would have so much love in their hearts for Muhammad that from the moment they declared the kalima, they did not hesitate to lay down their life for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What brought about this sudden change, you know, this revolution within the heart? I mean, look at Thumamat ibn Uthar, look at his words. Not only does he declare the kalima, la ilaha illallah, just listen I'm under the, over the words. He says, he says to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, ma kana ala al-ardi wajhun abghada ilayya min wajhik. He says, I swear by Allah, before this, before I met you, before I talked to you, before I saw you inside the masjid, there was no face on the face of this earth which I hated more than your face. He's saying there was no one that he hated in the dunya more than Muhammad. And now he's saying, okay, Ya Rasulullah, now there is no face on this dunya which I love more than your face. How can that be? What brings about such change that within a zillion of a second, one moment you hate this individual like you hate no other one. And then the next moment, such a change that you, you love this individual so much that you can lay down your life for that individual. What brought about that change? He says, Wallahi ma kana min deenin abhada ilayya min deenin. There was no deen which I hated more than your deen. But now, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no deen more beloved to me than your deen, the deen of Islam. And then he says, Wallahi ma kana min baladin abhada ilayya min baladin. Oh Muhammad, there was no city, there was no town which I hated more than your city, your town. Ya Rasulullah, now there is no city which I love more than Medina. Look at that, look at the transformation. And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, you know your men, they captured me. And I was going for Umrah, that was my irada, that was my intention. This is when they captured me. What should I do now? Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him glad tidings. He said, go perform Umrah. He goes to Makkah. And the people of Makkah have realized that he's declared the kalima. And they say to him, anyone that would declare the kalima in those days, they would say, this is Sabian. He's become a Sabian. He says, no, I haven't become a Sabian. I've declared the kalima with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the transformation in his heart and mind. When the kuffar said to him, and insulted him and said that you've become a Sabian. He said, no, 
I've declared the kalima. I swear by Allah now, not even a grain of wheat will come from your mama till Muhammad doesn't give permission. Now, not even a grain of wheat will come. He was the chief of the tribe of Banu Hanifa. These people used to grow wheat and this wheat used to come to Makkah and Medina and the different places of Arabia. Look at the transformation now, my young friends. He's not prepared to send a single grain of wheat. Look at the obedience to Rasulullah. He's given his heart to Allah and his Rasul that he's not prepared to do one single thing. He's not prepared to even send a grain of wheat till he doesn't consult Muhammad until Muhammad doesn't give permission. What brought about that change? That he placed his life in the hands of Rasulullah and he was prepared to do anything for Rasulullah. What brought about that change? These people wouldn't just declare the kalima La ilaha illallah. They were prepared to live down, down their lives for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why is it my young friend that today nobody's prepared to read the kalima La ilaha illallah. Yet we've been here for over 150 years. Let me tell you why. I'll sum it up in a nutshell and I conclude. I already apologize. I've taken more than my fair share of time. One hour is more than suffice. But by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you always honor me by sitting down and listening. And it's the warmth that I feel that makes me continue on the love that you show. Why would anyone want to declare the kalima la ilaha? You tell me, give me one good reason as to why people would want to declare the kalima la ilaha illallah today. Look at the Muslims. Look at our houses. Look at the areas that we live in. They're the filthiest. Covered with dirt everywhere. No, we can't even pick up the litter and throw it inside. Rubbish bins, we'll throw it on the floor. Our areas are filthy. You'll find our areas is where they sell dope, tech dope. We're the ones that probably bring it in the country. Dodging, deceiving, backbiting, slandering. Every vice, you'll find it within the Muslims. Why? Would anyone want to declare the kalima la ilaha illallah if this is what Muslims have to offer? This is on a, you know, a national level. And the same applies to us in England. All the gangsters, all the dope, it's the Muslims. Selling it, Muslims. Taking it, Muslims. Deception, Muslims. Fraud, Muslims. You know, in terms of population, we're nothing. But we've got the biggest population in the prisons. It's full of Muslims. Why would anyone want to declare the kalima la ilaha illa illallah if this is what it means to be a Muslim? It's all right you saying, but look at our book, look at our teachings. Who's going to read your teachings? Who's going to read your book? You don't read your book. When you read the Quran, when? By mistake in when? The month of Ramadan, because your mother and father tells you that you're going to do at least one khatam. You wipe away the dust, it's been in your closet the whole year round. And in Ramadan, you'll wipe away the dust from your Quran. Yeah? And majority of us struggled to read two, three pages because the last time we read it was in Madrasa when we were at the age of 12, 13. We've never opened the book. We don't even know what it looks like. Never mind understanding the book. We can't even read the book. If this is you and I that were born as a Muslim by the grace of Allah, whose father and mother was Muslim, whose grandfather were Muslims for generation. This is how much you, the love that you and I have for the Quran, that we don't open the Quran and read the Quran. Do you expect these kuffar to read the Quran? Why should they read the Quran? That's on a local level, on a national level. Look at, just look at the recent bombings in Paris. How can you justify that as a Muslim? Is this how our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have behaved? Is this what our Rasul has taught us? That you go killing innocent people? Women, children, the very people, our teachings are so pure and so good. That even at the time of battle, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised and orders, ordered us 
you will not kill a woman. You will not kill a child. You will not kill an old woman, old man. You will not uproot trees. These were the teachings of Rasulullah at the time of jihad, at the time of battle. When you can't kill a woman, child, and an old man at the time of battle, then where can you just go and blow them up innocently like this? Tell me, if this is the image that we're portraying as Muslims, then who's going to declare the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? We need to live by these teachings ourselves. We need to implement, we need to familiarize ourselves with these teachings. And we need to bring these teachings in our lives. I swear by Allah. If every one of us lived by the Islam of Rasulullah, not some of the Islam that we see today. There are people today that declare the kalima la ilaha illallah. They're not honoring Islam, they're insulting Islam. Because these are not the teachings of the Quran. These are not the teachings of our Nabi. They are not the teachings of Islam. And they claim to be Muslims. I swear by Allah, if you lived by the Islam of Rasulullah and by the teachings of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my young friends, people will declare the kalima la ilaha illallah just like they declared the kalima at the time of the Sahaba, at the time of the Tabi, at the time of the Tabi. Why did Muslims' armies invade places like Indonesia, places like Malaysia? It was Muslim businessmen. People were so influenced by their personality of these businessmen that they declared the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And if you and I were to adopt those very same teachings, our conduct, our character, my young friends, and we need to interact with the wider community. Now as Muslims, one of the mistakes that we've made in England is, and you're probably making it here, we seclude ourselves thus to our own communities. We don't interact. You know, if the Sahaba didn't interact, if the Sahaba didn't travel far and wide to Pakistan, Hindustan, to the different corners of the globe, would you and I today be declaring the kalima la ilaha illallah? Would you and I be Muslims today if the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een different travel far and wide? Islam is not just for you and me. Islam is a universal religion. And Allah has blessed you and me with Islam. There is no gift that Allah has given us better than Iman, better than Islam. And it is only right of the inhabitants of this country in which you live in. And you live here as a minority. My young friends, you came to this country and they've embraced you with open arms. Just like in England, when our fathers came there and they came for only one reason, for a better life. These people embraced us. They give us the benefits, the houses, the, uh, you know, every, you know, the medicine. Everything is available, my young friends. And they've embraced us. They've given us everything. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, my young friends, we find it difficult to share with these people. They will hold us to account on the day of judgment and Allah. They came to our land. These people were originally from Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. Wallah, they migrated to our land. We received them with open arms. We gave them everything. We took care of them. We didn't send them back. Wallah, we gave them more ease than they had in their own countries. This is why their fathers never went back. Because of the ease that they received in this country. But Allah, they had Iman. They spent hundreds of years living with us. They never for once ever shared the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I ask you my young friend, when you stand before the Almighty Allah on the day of Jumat and one of these kafirs says this to Allah, how will you answer or how will you show your face to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Hidayat is in the hands of Allah. Innaka la tahdi man ahbab walakin Allah yahdi man yasha. You can't guide, Allah guides. Well, that, mean, that, that does not mean to say my young friend, you don't try, you don't strive, and you share this message with the wider community. It will be in your best interest. My young friends, Allah give me the tawfiq to understand. Allah give you the tawfiq. Allah give me the tawfiq to act upon this message that I've conveyed to you. Allah give you the tawfiq.